time for a Little House on the Prairie. We're working on chapter 12 today. Um, and make sure that you have your vocab sheet, which you will complete the last word, winless, um, for chapters 1 through 12. So this will get turned in this week on Friday. Um, and... You have your trifold. We'll finish chapter 12 today, so that'll get turned in on Friday. And then after you're done reading, you are going to do a science experiment. You should have this paper, who put out the candle, in your pile of Little House on the Prairie things. Um, and then you are going to um, write about it at the bottom. Um, this does... You know, in uh, does require lighting a candle with fire, so make sure that you have a grown-up around when you're doing that and that you get permission. All right, so as we read chapter 12, which is about building the well, um, we are going to look for the word windless and a picture of it as well so we can describe it later. Um, it has to do with a well, and so we will you will notice it really easily. We're also working on inferring today for chapter 12. You'll see we have some magnifying glasses with one, two, and three in them. So we are going to make a conclusion based on clues from the story where they don't actually tell us exactly what happened. We use the clues in the story and what we know from real life, in this case from science, um, to think about and make a conclusion about building a well based on what we read in here. And so we're going to put our inference here at the end. And then we're going to put why, the three reasons why, down below. Um, actually, not why. Um, clues from the story, which basically is why. Clues from the story that made us decide to make that conclusion about building a well. So I'm going to put that over there and I'm going to get my book and we're going to go to chapter 12 which is fresh water to drink. It starts on page 147. I'm getting about halfway through the book today. Yep, after this chapter we'll be just about halfway through the book. There's like 26 page, or chapters so it's getting close. Take us right through the end of the school year. All right. I love this chapter. Um, it's exciting, dangerous, a science experiment with it. Fresh water to drink. Pa had made the bedstead. A bedstead is what we would call a bed frame today. So that's the wooden part that sets your bed up off the floor with the headboard and maybe a footboard. So he'd already built, he's built that and it's going to tell us a little bit about how he did it. His would definitely not be as fancy as ours, but he's got that done. And um, after it tells us how he did it, we're going to learn about a well. And we're going to meet um, a character we've heard about, Mr. Um, a neighbor that lives close by them. That was described earlier. Him and his wife live, I think they said, like four, three or four miles away. And um, that is, oh, let me remember what his name is. Mr. Scott. So Mr. and Mrs. Scott. Pa met them um, when he went out exploring in our wolf chapter. They, he described them. But we haven't actually met or got to know them in person yet until this chapter. Pa had made the bedstead. He had smoothed the oak slabs till there was not a splinter on them. Then he pegged them firmly together. Four slabs made a box to hold the straw tick. We'll talk about that in a minute. Across the bottom of it, Pa stretched a rope, zigzagged from side to side, and pulled tight. On one end of the bedstead, Pa pegged solidly to the wall in a corner of the house. Only one corner of the bed was not against a wall. At this corner, Pa set up a tall slab. He pegged it to the bedstead as high as he could reach. He pegged two strips of oak to the walls and to the tall slab. Then he climbed up on them and pegged the top of the tall slab solidly to a rafter. And on the strips of oak, he laid a shelf above the bed. There you are, Caroline, he said. Well, I guess it is pretty fancy. You put a shelf and everything. 
Oh, I can't wait to see it made up, said Ma. Help me bring in the straw tick. So this is, tells you what a straw tick is. It's a pioneer version of a mattress, and this is how she made it. She had filled the straw tick that morning. There was no straw on the high prairie, so she had filled it with dry, clean, dead grass. It was hot from the sunshine, and it had a grassy, sweet smell. So they put that inside of the cloth covering of what would be like a mattress. Um, it's soft for a while, and then it gets broken down pretty quick, and then it's not as soft um a far cry from our modern mattresses but it was better than sleeping on the ground paul helped her bring it inside the house and lay it in the bedstead she tucked the sheets in and spread her prettiest patchwork quilt over them at the head of the bed she set up the goose feather pillows and spread the pillow shams against them on each white pillow sham two little birds were outlined with red thread then Pa and Ma and Laura and Mary stood and looked at the bed. It was a very nice bed. The zigzag rope was softer than the floor to sleep on. The straw tick was plump with the sweet smelling grass. The quilt lay smooth and the pretty pillow sham stood up crisply. The shelf was a good place to store things. The whole house had quite an air with such a bed in it. Um, and then I... It's my understanding that about once a year, like every summer or every fall, you would take your straw tick out mattress outside, you would empty it out, and you would wash it, and then you would refill it with new grasses or straw if you had straw. That night when Ma went to bed, she settled into the crackling straw tick and said to Pa, I declare I'm so comfortable it's almost sinful. Mary and Laura still slept on the floor, but Paul would make a little bed for them as soon as he could. He had made the big bed, and he had made a stout cupboard and padlocked it, so the Indians could not take all the cornmeal if they came again. Now he had only to dig a well, and then he would, could make, he would make that trip to town. He must dig the well first so that Ma could have water while he was gone. And she couldn't go to the creek and haul water back. It would be too heavy. And she couldn't leave the children behind if Pa was gone. Um, and it's 40 miles to Independence. So it's a several day trip for him to go to town um, and get supplies and, and trade, their, trade their goods. So she has to be able to have everything ready to go. So he wants to do a well first. The next morning, he marked a large circle in the grass near the corner of the house. With his spade, he cut the sod inside the circle and lifted it up in large pieces. Then he began to shovel out the earth, digging himself deeper and deeper down. Mary and Laura must not go near the well while Pa was digging. Even when they couldn't see his head anymore, shovelfuls of earth came flying up. At last, the spade flew up and fell in the grass. Then Pa jumped. His hands caught hold of the sod, then one elbow gripped it, and then the other elbow, and with a heave, Pa came rolling out. I can't throw the dirt out from any deeper, he said. He had to have help now. So he took his gun and may, rode away on Patty. When he came back, he brought a plump rabbit, and he had traded work with Mr. Scott. Mr. Scott would help him dig this well, and then he would help dig Mr. Scott's well. Ma and Laura and Mary had not seen Mr. and Mrs. Scott. Their house was hidden somewhere in a little valley on the prairie. Laura had seen the smoke rising up from it, and that was all. At sunup next morning, Mr. Scott came. He was short and stout. And you'll see in the pictures, he's very round. His hair was bleached by the sun, and his skin was bright red and scaly. He did not tan. He peeled. It's this blasted sun and wind, he said. Beg your pardon, ma'am, but it's enough to make a sink. Use strong language. I might as well be a snake, the way I keep shedding my skin in this country. Laura liked him. Every morning, as soon as the dishes were washed and the beds made, she ran out to watch Mr. Scott and Paul working at the well. The sun was blistering, even the winds were hot, and the prairie grasses were turning yellow. Mary preferred to stay in the house and sew on her patchwork quilt. 
But Laura liked the fierce light and the sun and the wind, and she couldn't stay away from the well. But she was not allowed to go near its edge. Pa and Mr. Scott had made a stout windlass. It stood over the well, and two buckets hung from it on the ends of the rope. When the windlass was turned, one bucket went down into the well, and the other bucket came up. In the morning, Mr. Scott slid down the rope and dug. He filled the buckets with earth almost as fast as Pa could haul them up and empty them. After dinner, Pa slid down the rope into the well and Mr. Scott hauled up the buckets. Every morning before Pa would let Mr. Scott go down the rope, he set a candle in the bucket and lighted it and lowered it into the bottom. Once Laura peeped over the edge and she saw the candle brightly burning far down in the dark hole in the ground. Then Pa would say, seems to be all right, and he would pull up the bucket and blow out the candle. That's all foolishness, Ingalls, Mr. Scott said. The well was all right yesterday. Well, you can't ever tell, Pa replied. Better be safe than sorry. And so you see a picture of the windlass there. So it's a pulley system that goes over the top of a well so the buckets can go up and down in the well. Laura did not know what danger Pa was looking for by that candlelight. She did not ask because Pa and Mr. Scott were busy. She meant to ask later, but she forgot. One morning, Mr. Scott came, and of course, digging a well could take a short amount of time or a long amount of time. You had to dig and dig and dig as deep as you had to go until you found a pocket of groundwater um, between the layers of the earth. So it sounds like it's been a couple weeks to me. Uh, so then we have to go pretty far down, I think. They heard him shout, Hi, Ingles, it's sun up, let's go. Pa drank his coffee and went out. The windlass began to creak and Pa began to whistle. Laura and Mary were washing the dishes and Ma was making the big bed when Pa's whistling stopped. They heard him say, Scott. He shouted, Scott, Scott. Then he called, Caroline, come quick. Ma ran out of the house. Laura ran after her. Scott's fainted or something down there, Pa said. I've got to go down after him. Well, did you send down the candle? Ma asked. No, I thought he had. I asked him if it was all right and he said it was. Pa cut the empty bucket off the rope and tied the rope firmly to the windlass. Charles, you can't. You mustn't, Ma said. Caroline, I've got to. You can't. Oh, Charles, no. I'll make it all right. I won't breathe till I get out. We can't let him die down there, Ma said fiercely. Laura, keep back. So Laura kept back. She stood against the house and shivered. No, no, Charles, I can't let you, Ma said. Get on Patty and go for help. There isn't time. Charles, if I can't pull you up, if you keel over down there and I can't pull you up, Caroline, I've got to, Pa said. He swung into the well. His head slid out of sight down the rope. Ma crouched and shaded her eyes, staring down into the well. All over the prairie meadow, larks were rising, singing, flying straight up into the sky. The wind was blowing warmer, but Laura was cold. Suddenly, Ma jumped up and seized the handle of the windlass. She tugged at it with all her might. The rope strained and the windlass creaked. Laura thought that Pa had keeled over down in the dark bottom of the well and Ma, Ma couldn't pull him up. But the windlass turned a little and then a little more. Pa's hand came up holding to the rope. His other hand reached above it and took hold of the rope. Then Pa's head came up. His arm held on to the windlass. Then somehow he got to the ground and sat there. The windlass whirled around and there was a thud deep down in the well. Pa struggled to get up and Ma said, Sit still, Charles. Laura, get some water. Quick. Laura ran. She came hurrying back, hugging the pail of water. Pa and Ma were both turning the windlass. The rope slowly wound itself up and the bucket came up out of the well and tied to the bucket and the rope 
was Mr. Scott. His arms and his legs and his head hung and wobbled. His mouth was partly open and his eyes half shut. Pa tugged him onto the grass. Pa rolled him over and flopped where he was rolled. Pa felt his wrist and listened to his chest, and then Pa lay down beside him. There they are pulling him out of the well. That must have taken a lot of uh, strength. He's breathing, Ma, Pa said. He'll be all right in the air. I'm all right, Caroline. I'm playing plum tuckered out is all. Well, Ma scolded, I should think you would be. Of and if of and the senseless performances. My goodness gracious, scaring a body to death all for the want of a little uh, a little reasonable care. My goodness, I she covered her face with her apron and apron and burst out crying. That was a terrible day. I don't want a well, Ma sobbed. It isn't worth it. I have I won't have you ru running such risks. Mr. Scott had breathed a kind of gas that stays deep in the ground. It stays at the bottom of wells because it is heavier than the air. It cannot be seen or smelled, but no one can breathe it very long and live. Pa had gone down into the gas to tie Mr. Scott to the rope so that he could be pulled up out of the gas. When Mr. Scott was able, he went home. Before he went, he said to Pa, you were right about that candle business, Ingalls. I thought it was all foolishness, and I would not bother with it, but I found out my mistake. Well, said Pa, where a light can't live, I know I can't, and I like to be safe when I can be. But all's well that ends well. Pa rested a while. He had breathed a little of the gas, and he felt like resting. But that afternoon, he raveled a thread from a toe sack, and he took a little powder from his powder horn. He tied the powder in a piece of cloth with the one end of the toe string in the powder. Come along, Laura, he said, and I'll show you something. They went to the well. Pa lighted the end of the string and waited till the spark was crawling quickly along it. Then he dropped the little bundle into the well. In a minute, they heard a muffled bang and a puff of smoke came out of the well. That will bring the gas, Pa said. And what he means by that is the explosion will burn up the gas that is there. That'll be the fuel for the expo explosion after the um, gunpowder. And that will burn all of it out so that good, clean air can be there. So when the smoke was all gone, he let Laura light the candle and stand beside him while he let it down. All the way down in the dark hole, that little candle kept on burning like a star. So next day, Pa and Mr. Scott went on digging the well, but they always sent the candle down every morning. There began to be a little water in the well, but it was not enough. The buckets came up full of mud, and Pa and Mr. Scott worked every day in deeper mud. In the mornings, when the candle was went down, it lighted um, oozing wet walls and candlelight sparkled in rings over the water when the bucket struck bottom. Pa stood knee deep in water and bailed out bucketfuls before he could begin digging in the mud. One day when he was digging, a loud shout came echoing up. Ma ran out of the house and Laura ran to the well. Pull, Scott, pull, Pa yelled. A swishing, gurgling sound echoed down there. Mr. Scott turned the windlass as fast as he could, and Paul came up climbing hand over hand up the rope. I'm blamed if it that's not quicksand, Paul gasped as he stepped onto the ground, muddy and dripping. I was pushing down hard on the spade when all of a sudden it went down, the whole length of the handle, and water came pouring up all around me. A good six feet of this rope's wet, Mr. Scott said, winding it up. The bucket was full of water. You showed sense in getting out of that hand over hand angles. That water came up faster than I could pull you out. Then Mr. Scott slapped his thigh and shouted, I'm blasted if you didn't bring up the spade. Sure enough, Pa had saved his spade. In a little while, the well was almost full of water. A circle of blue sky lay not far down in the ground, and when Laura looked at it, a little girl's head looked up at her. When she waved her hand, a hand on the water surface waved too. The water was clear and cold and good. 
Laura thought she had never tasted anything so good as those long, cold drinks of water. Paul hauled no more stale, warm water from the creek. He built a solid platform over the well and a heavy cover over the hole that let the water bucket through. Laura must never touch that cover, but whenever she or Mary was thirsty, Ma lifted the cover and drew a dripping bucket of cold, fresh water from the well. Well, that was an exciting chapter. Now, you'll see here that the well looks a little bit different than you saw in the video, a tour of uh, Laura Ingalls' home sites. Um, if you watch the part on Little House in the Prairie, which many of you did, um, you saw the house and then you saw a well outside. And that is the actual well um, that Pa dug. But at some point in time after the Ingalls moved away, someone built the stone part around it, the round part, and then the windlass on the top. When they lived there, they just had the wood cover over it to keep it safe for little girls. But, so you've seen that. So let's go to our vocab sheet. We're doing our last word on the first vocab sheet. And that is windless. And we saw pictures of that. We heard about them using it quite a bit in this chapter um, to save Mr. Scott and Pa um, on two different occasions. So we know that it is a pulley system used to move buckets up and down a well. All right, a pulley system used to move buckets up and down a well. All right, if you need to, pause the video and finish copying that. But I'm going to erase it and we're going to go on to our trifold. So we are doing an inference, a conclusion based on things that we read in the chapter um, and about building a well. So if we were at school, I would ask you guys to give me some ideas about what would you say about building well. And I will tell you that usually this is the inference that I get. So we're going to go with this one um, since we're not together to talk about that. And um, what most classes have told me is building, I shouldn't say building, digging, digging a well is dangerous. Okay, so on our trifold in this box right here, we're going to write digging a well is dangerous. Sorry, got everything mixed up around there. Okay, then down at the bottom, we have three magnifying glasses. And we are supposed to put our examples of clues in the story that support our inference. So three times in the chapter that we saw an example of how digging a well is dangerous. All right, so let's see. Let's go to... Um, The very first one I would think would be before Mr. Scott started to come, and that is, it is dangerous because you are underground. Remember, Pa can only dig down so far by himself um, so that he could get back up out of the hole. If he had continued on his own, he wouldn't be able to get back up out of the hole at some point. So he had to get help. 
Um, so that's one way that it is dangerous. The second way was the was quite dramatic, and that is there are deadly gases underground. All right, there are deadly gases underground trapped down under the layers of soil and rock. And if you um, break through into one of those pockets of gases, um, you are exposed to that and they can kill you while you are underground. So those two go together. All right, the last way that digging a well is dangerous was paw at the very, very end. When the water comes into the well, when you've dug down far enough and you have hit the groundwater and your well is going to fill up, um, you have to get out of there really quick or you can drown or you're going to drown. So that would be the third way you could drown. And Paul got up and out of there and Mr. Um, Scott pulled, 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 pulled on that windlass and got him up. Um, as the water came rushing into the well. Thankfully, he was working with a partner, and he was safe, and he was not going to get um, trapped down in there. So, obviously, digging a well is something that you should never do by yourself, which could be another difference we could have made, too. Digging a well is something you should never do by yourself. All right, so now you have finished that vocab sheet and you have finished the trifold and those will go in your turn-in pile. Um, you have one more thing to do with this chapter and it's this paper called Who Put Out the Candle? And you're going to do a little quick science experiment in which you're going to um, ex show um, what happens when a candle goes into an area in a well where there's this other gas, this gas that um, doesn't burn like oxygen does. In, your, in yours, you're going to try it with a glass jar if you have one. If you don't have one and you're not able to do this activity, um, then, you know, just tell me about it. You could probably write the answers at the bottom even without doing the activity part first, but it is kind of fun. So it says you're going to need um, a small candle, uh, safety matches, a glass jar that's taller than the combined height of the candle and the candle holder, um, or an ashtray. The ashtray is not something you def that definitely need. Your procedures are put the candle in the candle holder, light, use a match to light the candor, candle, candor, candle, Make sure you have an adult help you. Um, extinguish the match and put it in the ashtray or throw it away carefully. Make sure it does; it's not still warm. Then very carefully set the glass jar upside down over the candle and the candle holder. And the opening of the jar should rest flat against the table. Then you're going to observe what happens as the candle is inside the jar. So then you have some observations at the bottom. You have five questions to answer. Describe what happens when the jar is put down over the lighted candle. So tell exactly what happens as you observe. Two, remove the jar and repeat the experiment and write what happens the second time. Three, draw a conclusion from your observations by completing the following statement. The candle cannot burn when, based on what you saw. Four, um, explain why the candle goes out when it is covered by the jar. We're going to do four and five together right now. So you'll answer four and five with me, one, two, and three on your own. So number four kind of gives away what's going to happen, but since we're not at school, I can't do it the way it's supposed to be done. So it says, why does the candle go out when it is covered by the jar? So we are simulating what happens in a well. In a well, you have other forms of gases that don't burn the way oxygen does. In the jar, 
our candle is burning until all of the oxygen is gone and if there is no oxygen then it cannot burn so why does the candle go out when it is covered by the jar it has used up all the oxygen so you're going to write that on number four. It has used up all the oxygen. Remember, you're doing one, two, and three on your own. Then number five, Pa said, where a candle can't live, I know I can't. What do both Pa and the candle flame need to live? Well, I that would be obvious. That would be oxygen. So if there's another gas in the well, um, there's no oxygen, Pa can't breathe, and it makes them sick. If there's no oxygen in the jar, the candle can't burn, and it goes out. All right. You need to, um, for your response, you're going to read to me what you wrote for one, two, and three on who put out the candle. Um... I'm not going to ask you to send a picture of your trifold. Just read to me those. And I'll look at your trifold and your vocab sheets when you turn them in. All right. See you for the next lesson on Thursday.